Hello and welcome to the 10th in the series of our, um, our sessions on AI neuroscience and architecture. Um, today I'm delighted to have Andy, Andy Clark as, as our guest. But before I introduce Andy, let me just say it's a few words about um, uh, what else is coming up this week on Saturday. We've actually had a very busy week in the last few days. We had our first ever session in Portuguese. We had sessions in, um, uh, in <coughs> we had sessions in, in um, uh, also in Spanish and, and Farsi and Arabic um, and yesterday in English. Um, and we have a session coming up uh, uh, on, on a, a workshop on Saturday. Um, and uh, this is then going to be the 10th in the series. I think that's 10. Um, and uh, it has been a terrific series, an absolutely terrific series. We've had some of the most astonishingly insightful talks. Um, uh, David Charm has been one particular one. Um, I mentioned because he collaborated with Andy Clark, but all of them have been remarkable. Um, we still haven't got a, a date for Antonio Damasio. It may be in the summer now. He hasn't, re hasn't replied to my invitation with a particular date, so we'll, let's just see, see. And they're all uploaded here. So if you want to go and find out um, more about these sessions, um, recordings are uploaded um, on the Digital Futures YouTube channel, along with our session on architecture philosophy from last semester. And there are more besides. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, some of them are extremely popular. They've all been popular, but some of them are more popular than others. Um, and uh, uh, this will be a repository available for free for students and for architects all over the world. And this is the purpose of Digital Futures, to share knowledge with everyone, regardless of where they are. Um, so today, it's really a great pleasure to introduce Andy. I, I, I like this particular um, yeah. image that was, um, I think it was in a New York Times um, article about Andy, um, <clears throat> a reference to uh, the extended mind. Um, uh, uh, and Andy, of course, is famous um, uh, not, not only because of, but, 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 but primarily because of this particular article on the extended mind that he um, wrote uh, with David Chalmers, that really opened up a whole series of inquiries um, that have been very fruitful. I, when I introduce Andy to my students, it's um, it's one thing. Um, but to introduce Andy in front of Andy is, is is another thing. There have been many books. There have been many books. Um, but these I think stand out as the, the last three as, as being the most significant. Natural born cyborgs, which a book that I set my students at FIU to read and they love it. Um, it's a very accessible book. Um, and I would say the cover is a bit deceptive. It's not necessarily about these kind of futuristic uh, Hollywood style cyborgs is about anyone who has a prosthesis, whether it's a walking stick or, 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 a, or a pair of glasses or whatever. Um, but that's a very significant book and very accessible book. Supersizing the mind kind of takes those debates sort of further. And Surfing Uncertainty is a book that I, one of my um, doctoral students in Tong Ji did his, his, his doctorate about, um, uh, Chao Yan. Um, and it kind of connects very much with the kind of ideas that are going on in Brighton right now at the University of Sussex um, that Anil Seth is also working on. Um, the University of Sussex, I would say, has, is now really a leading world centre. It was, of course, uh, uh, the place where a um, long time back we, we've, uh, we, we had people like Margaret Bowden writing about AI and creativity and really establishing um, a new kind of field of research. Um, so it's a very exciting time um, to be involved in all these these ideas, uh, as we've seen from this, uh, these particular sessions. Andy, I'd say, is somebody that uh, it's. I, I was just thinking, reflecting on this this morning. Um, Andy and I are a bit like, um, shall we say, uh, a bit like uh, uh, ships that pass in the night, in the sense that Andy was was also from the UK, and uh, uh, I actually went to school. I used to pass travel on the road right past where it is right now, Marine Parade in Brighton, going to my school at sea for a few miles uh, west of, uh, east of, um, of Brighton, while he was in the north of England. Um, and then Andy went across to the States to work while I was in Europe. And then when Andy came back to Europe, I went to, to the States and I'd been there for some time. And now we're in a situation whereby, in fact, like before I left the States, I was actually a professor in at the University of Brighton in Brighton. And somehow we didn't meet until very recently, but I'm very glad that we did meet. And now uh, he's uh, on living on Brighton, looking out over Brighton Pier. I'm on Venice Beach, looking out over Santa Monica Pier. They, they, you, on a certain days, you could see certain similarities, but uh, one has got pebbles and, uh, and the other one's got palm trees and sand and sun and surfing. So it's, but it's great to have you here, Andy. Um, uh, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, 
let me just uh, stop sharing my my screen. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite Andy. I would also mention that John Sutton is also here from from Macquarie in Australia. Has been he's been collaborating um, with Andy, uh, and it's one o'clock in the morning for, for John. So it's great to see you at such a such an ungodly hour. Andy, welcome. Um, you have a fan club in architecture. I know that many people follow your work. You've been inspiration for all. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks, Neil. It's a uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, a huge pleasure to be here and one that I'm actually uh, slightly nervous about because what I'm going to present today is very sort of very new stuff and so it's very sort of blue sky -y. Um, basically I think a lot of it isn't well worked out yet so I'd be very grateful for all um, all suggestions we've got basically six years to work this out now <laughs> so um, I'll share a screen and um, throw a few ideas out there let's see there we go to share and there we are so hopefully you can see architectures of the entangled mind up there in some kind of technicolor yes um good excellent so um this is funded by uh, a european research council grant called xscape for something like x landscapes you know um, different kinds of landscapes cityscapes um, monuments um, technological landscapes and so on. So what I'm going to talk about is this project. The project is at this sort of intersection of cognitive science, design, architecture, and cognitive archaeology. And it's pretty far out of my comfort zone. Um, so I think I'll, it's kind of useful to give a bit of narrative backdrop to this project. Um, back in 2018, I was contacted entirely out of the blue by Felipe Criado Boado, who is a, a Spanish um, a Spanish archaeologist, and he, along with a Spanish vision scientist, Luis Martinez, had written something that had just been accepted for scientific reports, which is under nature spin-off journals. It had a, a rather daunting title, which you can see down there, Co-Evolution of Visual Behavior, the Material World and Social Complexity Depicted by the Eye Tracking of Archaeological Objects in Humans. So it's one of those papers where the title gives you a pretty good idea I think, of what's going on. Um, it's a pretty unusual paper, but it did speak to a theme that has been very close to my heart. And it's this theme of how interactions with the built world might somehow alter in some non-trivial way the processes of thinking and reasoning. So that if we actually want to understand the evolution of the human mind, then really we need to understand something like the evolution of a sort of a human world structured whole, something like that. So it's this sort of, it's this idea that embodied action is binding things together in ways that are so tight that we really can't usefully think about uh, what minds are doing without simultaneously thinking about what worlds are doing. So it's that idea, that sort of picture of inseparability that sort of driven the, some of the stuff that, uh, that Neil was so kindly talking about there, all the way back to being there, putting brain, body and world together again, onto natural born cyborgs, onto supersizing the mind. But the focus of a lot of that stuff had been this notion of, of sort of merging with our technologies to create hybrid forms. That's a kind of extended mind idea. And the idea was that mergers don't really require wires and implants, which is why that cover was so inappropriate for that book, because <laughs> the main claim is that wires and implants don't matter. It's a kind of it's a dovetailing of um, technologies to what brains are doing that is doing the work. So what Criado and colleagues were doing was looking at something that was rather different. Um, not really augmentation technologies so much as just um, environmental accidents, you might think. They were basically looking at pots and they were looking at the way different pottery styles captured different patterns of eye movement. So you can see some of the kind of uh, pottery styles that they were looking at there, three Neolithic pots. Um, what the pilot study was, was an eye tracking analysis of what happened to contemporary humans when they were exposed to replicas of those pots. So what they were seeing were um, images, 15 replica pots, and eye tracking equipment was used to see what they did when they encountered those images. 
So eye tracking stuff, you're probably all pretty familiar with, you know, you can apply it to, um, you can apply it to advertising very successfully. So, you know, if you want to know how people are looking at your web page, eye tracking is a very good way of understanding some of that. You see where people are looking, in what order they're looking, and how long they're looking for. So you can use those traces also to generate a kind of heat map, the kind of visual exploration hotspots of where they're looking, which is what you see at the bottom right there. So it uh, surely tells us something, and this is what they got with the various pots. Um, basically, we'll come back to what these pictures show later, but the main thing to see is that the way that people's eyes were tracking across the pots um, came to have a much more vertical dimension as you move from left to right along the epochs here. So it's not surprising, I think, that different motifs make us look at things differently. And in fact, it looks like it's quite low level cues that are drawing the eye around. So the same gaze pattern is probably being exhibited here by ancient and contemporary humans. The pilot used a wide sample of modern humans. The results were robust across them all. So what they found, and the reason that there was a paper here at all, I think, is that there was a kind of correlation between social complexity and organization in these different periods and the different patterns of visual examination that they were finding. So in essence, the, the idea was that societies that had more hierarchical nesting in their civic organizations had pottery styles that encouraged more upwards and downwards forms of visual exploration. And they quantified this in a way that we can go through later if it's useful, but uh, as something called the vertical index of different types of pottery. But the main result was just that um, increases to the vertical index, which is just the way that your eyes are kind of tracking up and down as opposed to horizontally, corresponded rather closely to differences in hierarchical organization in the various um, societies that the pots came from. So higher vertical index correlates with more hierarchical nesting of governance and control. Sometimes. Um, so, you know, I think the right question to ask is, so what? What does this show? Um, the initial work, as they published it, doesn't really tell us that much. There's some provocative remarks in there, but really, this could just be nothing more than a case where complex societies have new ways of making stuff. And that stuff results in some distinctive designs that happen to have high vertical indexes. That seems to me to be entirely possible. The other possibility, the one that they sort of hint at in comments there, and the reason that I think there was a paper there, is that maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe there's evidence here of some sort of subtle circular loop in influence, linking visual encounters with pottery with a high vertical index to the construction of social orders with increasingly nested complexity. That would be the sort of, that would be the exciting hypothesis. The idea that pottery mediated scan path complexity and social complexity might each be feeding off the other. So, you know, I, I, I was fairly pessimistic about this. My own gut inclinations tended towards a deflationary hypothesis. But the main thing that I became interested in was a kind of different question that all that raised, which was a question, well, how could you ever decide between two hypotheses like that? You've got, on the one hand, radical entanglement, the complex worlds that we build and live in fundamentally and non-trivially, we'll come back to that, all to the way our biological brains think and reason. And, you know, there are folks that have asserted this. Forms of radical entanglement, I think, have been asserted by Daniel Dennett, um, uh, Mithun, Donald, Deacon, and many more. But we don't really have a general computational or cognitive neuroscientific model of how this might work. There are a few exceptions. There's a wonderful work by Stanislas de Haan on the way that the development of reading and writing altered human brains and cognitive processing. And there's also the work by John Sutton examining situated memory without so much of a computational model as de Haan, but detailed and important work. But there's no general theory here, as far as I know. It's also worth noticing that radical entanglement 
is consistent with, but not necessary for cognitive extension. So, you know, minds could become extended by augmentation technologies like smartphones, even if radical entanglement's false. That would happen if the new technologies altered the information that brains need to store and process, but not in some more abstract sense, the way those brains deal with problem spaces. And that's the sort of, that's a contrast that I, that I want to explore a little bit today. Um, I should also confess that, you know, this is clearly a kind of fuzzy line. Um, I think we need a much better way of demarcating the difference between radical entanglement and sort of vanilla entanglement, if you like. Um, so that's something I think we can creep up on using the resources of predictive processing, which is where we'll be going in a moment. So we got a European grant to study this. I have to say, I was very surprised by this. You know, I don't think I've ever been quite so surprised to get a grant as I was when we got this one. Um, so we got quite a large amount of funding for a six year project to just try to find ways to clarify and test these ideas about radical entanglement. And I think the reason that we got that grant is just because of the nature of a synergy grant. It's, um, it's a European Union initiative that is meant to bring odd groups of people together to look at odd problems that they wouldn't be able to look at individually. So we're a group that involves archeologists, philosophers, vision scientists, computational modelers, and deep past anthropologists as a, as a kind of um, sort of uh, loose grouping of, uh, of, of theorists. I think we fit that bill. So what was in the grant proposal? Well, we, we, we refined the hypothesis a bit and broadened it in some ways and narrowed it in others. So I'll get that on the table and then talk about um, how I think it might, it might look along some dimensions. The core idea that we pursued there is that the thing to think about here, if you're gonna try to shed light on even the possibility of radical entanglement, is something like altered patterns of attention at many levels of neural processing. So the idea would be that the built environment in all its forms doesn't just alter scan paths, but in fact, that's reflecting something much more fundamental, which is altered patterns of attention at every level of neural processing, not just, um, not just early ones, but all the way. So those altered patterns of attention, you could think of them as something like multi-level cognitive habits, although we'll be able to say a bit more about that in a moment. But the idea there is that by altering patterns of attention in that way, the encountered environment is constantly entangled with a changing sort of neural cognitive profile, each altering the other as we go along. So at the most radical end of the radical entanglement spectrum, the division between mind and environment is a sort of explanatory um, red herring. It's, it's not helpful because the thing that cognitively evolves is a, this sort of mind world machine that operates as a single dynamical whole. That's a picture that I've always been attracted to. And I think you can see many of the things that myself and other people mentioned earlier have been trying to do as, as sort of trying somehow to make sense of this and to see whether it's, uh, to see what's non-trivial about it, if anything, and how we might do things differently if it were true. So there's a question as, it, as you get to there, how are we gonna understand, demonstrate and choose between varieties of radical and indeed vanilla entanglement? So the ESCAPE project involves an awful lot of different moving parts. Um, a lot of those moving parts are actual case studies. They're planning 41 different worldwide case studies that will be conducted both within the original cultural setting and by taking objects and artifacts and situations, people, and kind of pushing them into different settings to see whether in particular eye tracking responses look the same or different, um, whether MEG responses look the same or different, and so on. So it's a big sort of, it's a big project on what you could think of as ecological vision, basically, although it's not supposed to all be about vision, but vision seems to be one of the easiest things to look at. There is a very daunting picture. Um, of the case studies that, uh, that they plan to undertake. And nothing makes me happier than the fact that I'm at some distance from having to do any of that work, because that looks really, really difficult. It'll be exciting to be part of it, um, but it looks really hard. 
There is, however, there's one clear danger in all this work, and that's why the Sussex team are there, I think. And that's the danger of mistaking simple correlations for evidence of two-way causation. Mistaking simple correlations for evidence of the operation of this kind of um, co-evolving dynamic whole that would be interesting in its own right. And the job of the Sussex team is to try and shed light on that. So what we're supposed to be doing is, first of all, kind of what philosophers do, which is um, plot and interrogate the conceptual landscape, ask ourselves in what various ways could built worlds non-trivially influence cognitive processing? What sort of evidence is already out there? And we'll look at some of this um, uh, in a few minutes. Um, and also to run a set of simulation studies. And the good thing about those is that they at least have a chance of proving causation. They can, in principle, prove an interesting kind of causation here. Um, of course, they can't prove that it actually happens in the real world, but at least it would happen in the simulations. So we chose a particular framework for the simulation studies and for thinking about this issue in general. And that framework is predictive processing also known, I think, actually more often nowadays as active inference. Um, I think this is becoming the dominant picture in computational cognitive neuroscience. But, you know, it's a very broad picture. It comes in in varieties itself. Um, the core idea there is that brains are embodied prediction machines, that perception, cognition and action are jointly determined by brains attempts to minimize long term prediction error during embodied interactions with the world. And so, you know, there are some introductions to this out there. Jakob Howey has an introduction, The Predictive Mind from 2013. I've got one from 2016 called Surfing Uncertainty. They're slightly different in that um, Howey is tempted by the idea that um, predictive processing goes best with a rather insulated picture of how um, brains work, how minds work whereas surfing uncertainty is much closer to the, um, to the extended cognition picture. And the idea is that by binding perception, attention and action into a single whole, um, the, the sort of cognitive machine can extend into the world. As I say, I'm not pursuing the extended mind aspect of that today in particular, but we can talk about it in discussion. It's clearly not very far away from this, um, this picture of a a dynamical whole spanning brain, body, and world. So what the PP systems do, what they're trying to do is reduce long-term prediction error during embodied encounters with the world. Prediction error is just a discrepancy between current sensor readings from, predict, from incoming light, sound, from inside the body, proprioceptive signals, and so on, and predicted readings. And the only way that you can do that, at least, I still believe this, there are a few people that might doubt it, but I think the only way that you can do this is to learn a model of self and world, a kind of predictive model, a structured generative model that aims to predict current sensor readings and how they should alter as we move and act. So those predictions structure human experience. They determine the policies that select actions, including eye movements, reaching for smartphones, all of our worldly engagement. And I think it is that there's a kind of, there's a deep unity in the predictive process in story between perception, attention, and action. Um, it's, it's that unity in a way that I think makes it an apt underpinning for the investigations of the escape project. So it is a long story. It ends up covering just about everything that seems intuitively cognitive. Um, obviously I'm not gonna rehearse the story um, in the remaining um, 15 minutes. Um, but one important feature of these accounts is that they make attention a key player. And that's the thing that I want to lean on a little bit. So attention in these models is basically varying estimates of precision. So precision is, precision is the inverse variance of prediction errors in these models. But the main thing to, to get on board here is that what assigning precision to different predictions and bits of sensory evidence does is allows us to balance what we know and what we currently sense, but also to balance which bits of what we know and what we sense are gonna, if you like, be most influential moment by moment. So precision assignments are doing an incredible amount 
of work in predictive processing uh, and in active inference. They are, they're determining how we use the knowledge that we have about the world. On the PP model, attention is not just a top-down tweak to a basically bottom-up mode of processing. I think it's uh, the heart and soul of fluid intelligence. It's a kind of constantly running that determines how you use and deploy whatever it is that you know and whatever evidence is coming in through the senses. So I think it would be impossible to underestimate the importance of precision estimations to predictive processing accounts. Um, one place where I think you can see that importance is in the explosions of work on predictive processing and computational psychiatry. The idea there is that deviant precision assignments cause atypical forms of thought and experience. And that's actually the focus of a book that I've got coming out in 2023, The Experience Machine. Um, there are lots of reviews of this kind of um, work down there. There's a good one, The Predictive Code in Account of Psychosis by Sturza and colleagues. So if PP is on track as a picture of how brains work, then I think altered patterns of attending would be some of the deepest possible alterations to our general profile of thinking. And that's the kind of glue that is supposed to be holding, holding this together. Um, we've got one very, 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 I cannot stress this too much, very tiny <laughs> result that shows that training a predictive process in artificial neural network on different pottery styles induces different attentional templates that we call culturally patterned attention styles and that they will influence processing in new tasks and domains. So it's a very minor proof of principle of the way that the built environment could impact the meta model that then impacts the way that you do other things. So notice then that this isn't just transfer of knowledge, it's transfer of patterns of attention. It's a kind of transfer of the broad shape of the meta model that determines how your first order knowledge gets accessed and deployed. And that's the kind of that's the core, or at least one of the core effects that we think the structured environment might be constantly having on neural processing. So we spend most of our days immersed in built and designed environments. They install templates for attention that we're simply not aware of. Architectures and spaces will train those patterns. They'll also prime some of those patterns against others. And that's just going to influence how you think and reason. And I guess our, one of the main hypotheses for the grant is that it's mostly by entangling attention that the built world transforms the mind. So that's a big bit of the story. But what we'd really like the project to do is something broader than that. We'd like the project to help us, help us get to grips with, help us unearth the principal components of material culture mediated cognition, the, the relatively few dimensions that do the most of the work. So in the remaining time, I'm just gonna briefly flag some other possible dimensions. I think these do all link in interesting ways into these ideas about tension, um, but I won't try and make those links too explicit here. Um, I'd love ideas for more principal components of material culture mediated cognition. That's, you know, I think, I think if, if the project even delivered a decent sense of what the principal components of that kind of, um, that kind of radical entanglement would be, then we would have done something worth doing. Okay, so some other things apart from, you know, that thing about um, patterning attention. One thing that we want to look at is what you could think of as externalizing precision. So this is a theme that's already there a bit in the PP literature. Attention in predictive processing is this variable precision weighting tool. If I want to find a pin that I've dropped in a bed of hay, my brain can up the precision on some bits of the visual information and down the precision on others. It can up the precision on the stuff that will pick out a small silvery object, increasing my chances of success. Seems important. You know, if you're looking for your car keys on a crowded table, early visual processing is actually behaving very differently to the way it would behave if you were looking for your coffee cup on a crowded table. Oh, talking of which, almost on cue, a cup of coffee arrives. Um, so um, in that way, though, I think well, what we think here is that built worlds are also reservoirs of precision that do a lot of this work for us. Even in the case that you see there of the pin dropped in the hay, 
you know, we've maybe built a world where um, pins have big red or green heads, and that's going to help you pick them out. It's kind of doing some of the um, work of precision for you. The human built world seems like a reservoir of achieved precision at estimation. If you put cheap cues uh, you know, around your broken down motor vehicle, what that's really doing is just screaming, assign high precision to incoming visual information. It's a way of cheaply alerting us that something here really matters. These sort of otherwise maybe arbitrary structures are local proxies for precision. And this goes back to stuff that was um, floated by Ropsturf and colleagues back in 2010, Ed Hutchins in 2014 and others. Urgent fonts, food packaging, and priestly robes are also um, uploaded precision estimates. They're saying, take this or that especially seriously. Squint a bit, and I think the whole of the human-built world and most of our patterned social practices, like stopping at red traffic lights, are a sort of bag of tricks for managing online precision estimation. I won't talk about it here, but I think language itself is a kind of um, artificial second system for managing precision. So if we throw words at ourselves, that's another way of upping the precision on certain aspects of our own processing and driving our own thinking a lot. Maybe a lot of, um, a lot of inner rehearsal takes that form. So it's also true that as we just behave in our world, we gradually alter it. And this is another way of uploading precision estimations into the environment, a sort of more accidental way. I guess the classic example here is laying down a path through walking. The path that other people took across the grass becomes visible, it attracts attention, that encourages other people to follow it. These are sometimes called desire paths. Intelligent buildings and cities are a clear um, opportunity for something like um, new forms of desire paths. There's an opportunity there for buildings and cities to acquire structure and signage automatically as a result of human use. That would be particularly easy in the case of augmented reality um, scenarios. This is um, Dave Chalmers picture of me actually, and I don't know how I feel about that, but that's supposed to be me at the corner there um, in some kind of augmented reality uh, situation, alerting me to certain things. My world looks very different to the way that other people's would. And my world has been structured by trails that myself and others lay down just by moving around it and buying things. So that's stuff about uploading precision. Um, second thing that I want to talk about is something that I think is hugely important. Um, to break in the grip of our own best internal models. Um, you know, predictive processing is a story that applies just as well to all kinds of, or many kinds of other creatures, certainly to other mammals and probably to other creatures too. On the other hand, human thought and reason seems to be somehow distinctive. We're going further and deeper. And I think part of that is that maybe by some sort of series of historical accidents and, and a sort of mosaic of adaptations, we're able to use material culture in a very systematic way to try to break the grip of our own best internal world models. It seems to me that could be a very, very powerful technique. I could say a, a bit about it. Um, so the idea there is that by materializing our own thoughts and ideas as objects, for example, mock-ups, models, um, we get new objects for attention, things that we can look at and interact with in different ways, in ways that might allow us to go further than we could just by interacting or consulting our own internal models. The idea there is that, um, that you can sort of, you can attend very differently to something if it's an actual model of some kind in the world. Deep down, I think this might be the most transformative thing that material culture ever did for us. So think about designing a new running shoe. The goal in predictive processing speak is to minimize expected future prediction error in ways that serve the preferred outcome of building a better sneaker. That's what that system wants to do. But suppose you can't see any clear route to that preferred outcome. There is no policy that is going to rise to the top there is the right way to do it. One thing you could do is try to reduce key uncertainties by breaking and reforming the generative model that's issuing the predictions. But that's 
a very, very hard thing normally to do. However, building and using real external models seems to help us humans in that process. Um, this is people doing stuff to design shoes. Um, speculation then is that materializing our own thoughts, our own inner models, if you like, as concrete external items, lets us independently attend to and therefore manipulate different bits of the design. We can attend to, to possibilities in new ways, ways that are not easily available just by continuing to think inside the box, inside the head. And of course, we can also, once we've materialized something, bring other people into the act, use that public object to the fulcrum for interacting with others over the design. The material model lets you explore possibilities in new ways. It's a bit maybe like physically shuffling Scrabble tiles in front of you. You can often come up with new words that way that you can't come up with, or not so easily, by trying to shuffle the letters in your head. I think that what we can do here is we can ask sort of what if questions that you don't get to otherwise ask. What if this thing I strongly believe turns out to be false? What if that bit of the shoe or sneaker design was replaced with something else? What would happen then? Models seem to help us there. Um, we seem to need to materialize our thoughts and ideas as more than just probabilistic trends. They need to be concrete things out there in the world. Maybe this is a sort of epistemic goal. It helps us transcend the limitations of our own inner models. And there's an example of this. It's quite an old example, but I still think it's revealing. Um, this is work goes back to 1985 on suggestive differences between search in memory and search using a real world model. What they did was um, they showed people by stable figures like the famous duck rabbit. They made sure that people had the general idea of flipping a by stable image. And then they showed them a new bistable image, one that they hadn't seen before. And then they took the image away and asked them if they could flip it in their imaginations. Um, in those early experiments, all subjects, including a number of vivid images, then failed. But they then said, well, now just draw what you remember and inspect your own drawing. And when allowed to draw from memory what they already recalled, they could then find the alternative interpretation by looking at their own drawing then everyone succeeded. Um, it turns out actually that people can sometimes do this in, in imagery. Um, the early experiments had certain flaws in them, but it is a lot easier to do it by, um, by drawing things. So once you, the idea there might be, once you've seen it one way, your own early interpretation tends to dominate. You've got this internal model, it's doing a pretty good job of minimizing prediction error relative to that bit of sensory input. Um, but you can break the grip of that model if you draw what you recall and then perceptually reinspect it. So there's a kind of process here of liberating attention. By drawing it, you can attend in ways that you can't attend just by, uh, if you like, consulting your own inner model, consulting your own imagination. Maybe near future collaborations between human architects and AI systems will add more layers to this. The AIs can use their own internal generative models in ways that produce um, concrete objects like the picture here that may help us see beyond the limits of our current models. So I think there's a, an interesting space for hybrid forms to emerge there. Art and design, I think, is plausibly in this model revealing model breaking business too. It lets us materialize and question our own highest level assumptions about ourselves and our worlds. I found a, an example of this the other day, um, which is uh, Bejnev Farahi's work on returning the gaze. Uh, you, what she was doing there is using technologies at a fashion show to materialize, to make concrete the onlooker's gaze, turning that elusive gaze into a very concrete object that we can then start to think about and further interrogate. So I think art is, art is very much, and design is very much in this model revealing, model questioning, perhaps model breaking business too. So is science. Science is a way of codifying and concretizing our best understandings. Again, we can stress test them um, by peer review and uh, all kinds of other tools and techniques, um, replication studies and so on. So I think there's a sort of unity here. We humans are, are just amazingly good at building the, and breaking 
these externalized models that push our own internal models along. Our best AI systems don't currently do this, nor does their mode of cognizing seem to demand it. This is just something that I'd like to understand better. Maybe true artificial in general intelligence, when it comes, will turn out to need to make use of embodied perception action cycles too. Or maybe it will just be so different that it doesn't need to. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention, if I don't know if I've got five minutes or if I should stop, um, Neil, your call. Please go ahead, please go ahead, please. Yep. Okay, last thing I want to mention is, this is like the most out there um, example, I guess, but I think that we sometimes use technologies to try to break our own self models. And a, a very extreme example of this is Max Hawkins. Um, Max Hawkins was a Google engineer working on the West Coast. It was his dream job in his dream city. He had found the best coffee shops, the best route to work. He ate in restaurants that served the best sushi and so on. Basically, he had um, done a very good job of optimizing his life. But at the same time, he started to feel as if somehow he wasn't really acting freely anymore. He felt as if he'd become trapped in a very small circle of actions, outings, and tastes. So trapped, he began to feel like he was a victim of his own highly optimized lifestyle. So, you know, being a, a Google engineer at that time, he just thought that he would write a bunch of algorithms to um, introduce more variety into his life. So for the next two years, he lived according to a series of randomization algorithms. You can guess what they did. Um, a diet generator told him what to eat. An algorithmic travel agent told him what city he would live in for the next two months because he was privileged enough to be able to go freelance and still survive. After that two months, a new city was automatically selected. Random Spotify playlists provided the soundtrack. A Facebook event selector told Uber drivers where to take him when he arrived in a new city. Basically, the algorithms told him where to go, what to eat, what leisure activities to engage in, what clothes and hairstyles he should adopt, and so on. He's even got a chest tattoo selected randomly, nearly randomly. He rejected some um, from images on the web. So that's an extreme and highly privileged case. And you might be wondering what it's got to do with the other cases that we were looking at. Um, maybe it's something completely different, um, but I don't think so. I think it's quite similar in one respect. Basically, he was using technological means here, looping outside of the kind of cognitive organization that was present in his, um, in his brain in order to try to find new ways of being in order to find um, a better way of being uh, Max Hawkins. So I think it is similar. I'm not sure about this, but it seems to me that this is a technologically mediated way of sort of stress testing our assumptions about who we are and what we like, a way of maybe more fully exploring the space of human potential. And you know, that seems to me to be very much like the stuff that people do with psychedelic drugs and other kinds of intervention. The benefits are maybe quite similar, sort of breaking the mold and revealing new ways to be. So we got a little paper about some of that. Okay, I will sum up and, uh, and stop. The, you know, the hope is to better understand the way material and digital culture shapes and permeates the mind. And you know, if you can make any progress on that, then it would be helpful because it would enable us to deliberately build better worlds to think in and better worlds to live in too. We think a key player is attention, precision, and we want to focus on that using predictive processing models, um, maybe get a little pipeline of simulations of different forms of materiality involving cognitive change going. But this is very early days, you know, uh, the grant has just kicked off, we've got six more years to go and all help and ideas gratefully received. We've also currently advertised in a couple of PhD studentships at Sussex. So if you know anyone that might be keen on work like this, um, point them in our direction. That's it. Thank you. Andy, that was that was uh, that was terrific. Um, that was really very good. I, I just I mean, there, I, there's so many uh, thoughts in my mind, but I just want to just share a reflection with everyone for a moment, which is to say going back to the kind of the analogy that was kind of like ships that, that, that pass in the dark and don't know about each other. I didn't know about your um, your 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 uh, uh, your cyborg book until till, till afterwards, which is probably a good thing because I was working on 
the question of adaptation more from a visual perspective. And of course, uh, the cyborg thing is, is more kind of Merleau-Pontian kind of body schema, bodily uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, processes of adaptation. But were, we were both looking at adaptation. Now, what is interesting now is, is that you're looking at the visual domain. And I, I was working on a kind of primarily psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic kind of viewpoint. Um, and this is precisely why I'm so interested by what's happening now in the realm of neuroscience, because psychoanalysis, I mean, I know that Anna Seth hates it, but, but, I mean, but I mean, it's something that comes up with, you know, it, it's, it, I mean, Freud supposes there's an unconscious and, and so it's, nothing is tested at all, nothing is proven. Uh, and this is the, the, real, the real challenge. Um, whereas, um, uh, whereas a neuroscience is, is trying to be systematic and, it, and, it's, and it's, you know, really making some headway towards trying to find, you know, to test things out. And I think that's really, that's really fabulous. Um, but let me just throw a couple of... of, of Interestingly, of, just while, 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 while you mention that, I think my understanding is that Carl Friston started out as a psychotherapist of some kind. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think there, he's also got a paper somewhere on something like free energy and Freud, something roughly in that ballpark. <laughs> Yeah, there was, there was, um, I mean, I, the one I, I quite like is the work of Slavoj Žižek and, and, right, and right. comparing that to say, you know, your work and Anil Seth's work and so on. The idea, I mean, so Žižek is saying that everything comes to us through, through the lens of fantasy, through the realm of the imagination, it, it, through that detour. Now that's not so far away from the, kind of the, the predictive perception sort of model in, in some ways. Um, but there are a number of things I wanted to kind of throw out there. And that is to say what, what I realized myself, which was kind of interesting in some ways because it relates quite closely to your Max Hawkins model, is that, I mean, the, the thesis I came up with in the book Camouflage is that actually it's all about how you begin to grow into spaces and kind of adapt to the life world and so on. How after a while you feel, start feeling at home in an apartment and so on. All this kind of process, we naturally uh, absorb that world and it becomes part of us, you know. And, and I was, the, the thesis is, well, you know, actually, um, and, and actually design helps. Um, design helps in the sense that we will eventually adapt to anything. And I was using an example of um, um, uh, the, um, I the name of the penitentiary just outside San Francisco, the island. Um, but uh, anyway, any prisons, even prisons, we will get adapt to. And, and there, are, there are stories about prisoners, you know, completely uh, uh, identifying with their cell, you know, almost like it becomes like a friend. You know? So there's stories of this of how it happens. Um, I think Hawkins comments that it became very, very normal for him after the first month or two of this, uh, of living this, this randomized way. Yeah. Which yeah. I think, you know, it's a predictive regime reasserting itself at a kind of higher level. He's now got a sort of a, a very, a very sort of abstract high level prediction system that just predicts the relevant bits of uncertainty. And that's, uh, you know, that's obviously, uh, that's him back in the kind of usual realm, really. <laughs> Yeah, well, what, what I guess what I found is my, my thesis as an architect, as a designer, was that actually good design, whatever that might be, helped that process of assimilation. Uh, and it, that came out of, a, out of Adorno's thinking, what he called sensuous correspondence. Um, and that was fine, as far as the group that I belong to is concerned, and one could argue, sure. But the problem is, is that, that, that there are different constituencies of taste out there, which I think is something that, that, that Max is also touching on in some ways. In, the, in that, you know, whatever my values are, and I always, I, I, I'm sure my sister hates me for this, but I always use the example of my sister in Tunbridge Wells, because that, 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 that I, I, I turn up and, and I dress in a certain way. I mean, you know, basically architects dress in black, and you think, well, why is that? You know, and that's a big question anyway. But and sometimes I wear these kind of ridiculously bright yellow Nike uh, sneakers, which which actually look quite striking. Now I go to my sister's, and she's a, a retired te school teacher, and she looks at them and says, "Neil, you're not a school teacher, and you're not a, a school kid anymore. You know why are you wearing those?" And I go to Zaha Hadid uh, Architects in London, and Patrick Schumacher will say, "Wow, where did you get those? I want a pair." You know. In other words, there are different constituencies of, of taste, and you know you can imagine that, that you know, for example. Now, what is what is a sense of paradise or a sense of, of well-being for well for me it's kind of it's a it's a design by zaha or something but there are other people for whom you know maybe a room full of model railways is their idea of heaven or you know or maybe it's a starbucks uh, cafe and in other words there's so many different constituencies of taste you can't really come up with any universal um, model um which is which is challenging and there's something else i want to throw out there as well which comes out of um uh uh um, it com comes out of um, 
uh, uh, Adorno's work, and that's to say, how do you situate style in this thing? Because it, I mean, architecture is kind of interesting because it, it is both. There are some things that, that that remain relevant forever. You think of you know the, the Acropolis or I don't know King's College Chapel or all these things, all these you know, charming you know uh, buildings and you know, cities, towns like you know Lewis or whatever. You know they're beautiful and everybody likes them. But at the same time, um, at certain moments there are styles of architecture that come in and they go out. And, and Adorno makes this kind of comment that uh, after a while, I mean, their, their role is to somehow to, to, to connect with the sort of values of the time. And one thinks about how Wittgenstein was designing a building in the kind of modernist style, like Adolf Loos. And it was, modernism was around for a while, then things change. And there's another kind of, I guess, set of mediating or a mediating aesthetic that comes out, you know. So the, the Baroque at one stage, you know, really was relevant. And then after a while, we moved to a different period, and the Baroque seems to be this completely decadent excess that has no relevance whatsoever. So you get these kind of mediations, and also I would say, obviously, cultural ones. You know, what is relevant to certain societies different to others, and, and, and gendered ones, and age ones as well. So the idea that somehow you could ever find a universal model, I think it's going to be challenging in some ways, but I, you know, I think this research would be incredibly interesting for architects to try and see what outcomes come out. Uh, but I think the Max Hawkins one is, is, is really interesting because, you know, it's a, this, this small circle he was trapped in, there's a kind of style police that's telling him what to do and so on. And to try and deviate from that is, is, a, is, a, is a very interesting one because, you know, frankly, any architect, around probably most of the people are watching now wearing black and you think well, why is that what is going on so i, I would just say that, that, that it's, it's extremely challenging from the kind of the, the the material that i got which is just not nothing proven but just kind of comments from people like adorno um and so on um let me just yes i mean i think just to sort of uh, you know jump in a bit on the style kind of thing um you know one thing that you can definitely say about predictive processing systems is their general purpose structure learners so they just automatically pick up structure from the environment. They're not, they're not sort of primarily problem solvers like reinforcement learning agents. They're, all they want to do is minimize prediction error, really. And so, um, you know, if there's, uh, if there's no practical payoff currently of a high value payoff available, then they will happily just learn and explore. I think that means that small initial differences in the kind of environment that they like kind of stuff you might expect to happen genetically will just mean that they will self-select a, a sort of a bunch of environments. They'll pick up patterns from those environments and they'll become increasingly divergent in, in, in that sort of way. Um, so I think there's something, there is something important about these systems being um, general purpose structure learners. Um, and it's it somehow, it, it, I, I think it, it makes a sort of divergence of style stuff seem sort of less surprising somehow it's um hmm. yeah yeah that, i just to say to everybody that if you want to ask some questions i've got a, a couple there's a question in the chat i've also got a question that's been sent to me directly that i'll ask um but just for one yeah. one further point I, I, it strikes me that actually there's a there's the the road signs were very very important because they're ones you pay attention to you know and i think there's there has to be a, a really interesting psychology to, to the traffic signs themselves. And you know, we, we need to be able to understand them immediately and so on. But there's a comment that Walter Benjamin makes, which kind of challenges you, one of your assumptions. And he says, in terms of buildings, we look at them in a state of distraction. They're just this background horizon out there. And I, I sometimes think the mistake that architects make is to assume that somehow uh, they have to be all different and they have to be, yeah, yeah. so the, I mean, for most modern architects, they're kind of they they're vying for attention, shall we say? Most buildings, and, they, and there's, the city becomes this collection of these. But you go to a place like Bath, or I don't know, um, where everything is kind of similar, and that actually works quite well. It's almost like the notion that Gianni Vattimo has of, of weak thought. There's this being this yeah. background condition is actually a, a very relevant one for, for for the built environment, and maybe we shouldn't be strenuously trying to seek attention to our buildings and just accept the fact that there's this kind of background horizon of consciousness. Yeah, yeah actually, so there's um, the, there was a the, there were a bunch of things that I thought about saying that I decided not to because I thought it would confuse the issue. 
but they were all about the role of affect in, um, in, in these things. And affect is, is another one of these sort of principal components. Um, the kind of thought there is that there's this, some kind of balancing act to be done between environments that, if you like, um, attract attention and enable us to do the thing that seems to give us a certain kind of affective punch, which is minimize more than expected amounts of prediction error. Seems like predictive processing systems love that, that sort of, you know, a good slope of error minimization, more than expected error getting minimized. That's what they like best. That's what Max Hawkins wasn't having, I think. He was just having expected amounts of error being minimized um, until his algorithms pushed him out of his comfort zone. So that's kind of one side of the equation, loving that sort of environment. At the same time, look at all the stuff that, say, Moshi Bar is doing on mind wandering. The, you know, the kind of importance of creating worlds that aren't busy attracting our attention so that attention can float around more freely in the kind of inner world without being captured by our plans, our projects, or the stuff that's around us. Um, I think somehow getting that, getting that balance right is something that, uh, that we need to think about a lot harder if we're thinking about sort of architecture and well-being, for example. It's sort of, um, we kind of want, we, we want things to do both of these jobs. Um, you know, the world that I inhabit is not going to change the way that I process information unless I actually assign high precision to those, to some aspects of that incoming information. If I assign no precision to any of it, then nothing would ever increase my learning rate or, or drive change. So in some way, there's a sort of chicken and the egg sort of thing here, you know, for environments to have these kind of effects, you already have to be assigning precision in certain sorts of ways. But then once you do that, they can drive changes in the way that you assign precision. So maybe it's a sort of, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of step in effect. Um, anyway, it's uh, yeah, I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of questions that float around affect here that, uh, that I, I, I think we should be able to bring in using the predictive processing framework. Just one comment, I, I, I'm not sure we found that it's cool. Um, uh, the, the, the building changing, but actually Wang Yu He, um, who did that, uh, mm -hmm. she's one of my doctoral candidates on the, the FIU DDES program. Uh -huh. She's normally here, actually, it's, it's not today for some reason, but uh, that is um, it's kind of interesting that, what, that that practice has built up. There are 300 people working for her and uh, they get to the stage where they're competing with, against the, the some of the best in the world. And we're almost getting to the point where she's beating them using AI, which is kind of interesting. It's a bit like the AlphaGo scenario. You can suddenly right. pay attention when that happens. But uh, there are, we do have in the chat here, we have Emmanuel Coe, who is uh, the person who wrote the first book on AI. So um, and maybe he'll be right. able to offer some, some comments. And there are also several others here. I've got a comment that came, comes in from Philip Beasley, which I tried to cut and paste in the chat and I can't. So let me read it out to you. Philip okay. Beasley is actually one of the world's top uh, um, interactive designers. Um, he, he does a lot of work also with Iris van Herpen, one of the leading, one of the most progressive fashion designers, and uh, uh, also Matt Gorbay, who's in the chat, who's, who's again one of our doctoral students, um, is, is has been working with him. But let me just read out um, uh, read out uh, his question. Um, so Philip Beasley, uh, within the general class of material configurations and designs that foster kinds of radical entanglement of commission with the built environment. Cool. Our Western humanist architecture seems to have, off, have often worked with penetrative um, and clarifying binary kinds of signposting for increased precision, rooted in intense contrast, walls and shells, spires and towers. Yet I'm very curious about my own experience of pathfinding, say in a forest in the snow where I trace little paths of animals far into the distance where the opposite, uh, the opposite of, of emphasis and clarity seems to be at work. I wonder about how the tiniest quavers, scratches and flickers might work in this. Might something like inverse signpost be at work, where it is the subtle semi-quaver and inconstancy, perhaps the instability itself, that we are primed to see? Could you speculate about inverse kinds of material modeling where precarity rather than bold and clear emphasis might be a source of emphasis. Um, uh, I was reading that out fresh, so I'm not quite sure whether I, I got that right. But I think, did you get that that that, that comment? 
Yeah, I think I, I think I get the flavor of that. And I think it's really, really interesting and important. The, um, you know, it's certainly true that an awful lot of the most obvious ways that we've structured environments are, are, are fairly brutal in a sense, you know, the, you know, the big, big red sign on the road kind of thing. Um, whereas when we interact with other non-humanly structured environments, we often find ourselves having to pick up very, very small hints and cues. And that seems to actually be something that is worthwhile for training human cognition. So I think, I think that's exactly right. There's a way of thinking here about expertise, um, maybe the expertise of someone following a trail through the woods or something like that, where expertise really does consist in, in being able to assign preci high precision to very small indicators. So, you know, the, 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 the tiniest little indicator, if it's the thing that you really need to know about right now in order to, I don't know, find a certain kind of animal in the woods, um, that can then be assigned high enough precision to really jump out at the expert. So, you know, you can sort of, I think it, it, it's almost as if experts kind of live in a, in a world of uh, augmented reality already, kind of, you know, different things are jumping out, different things are kind of labeled. But I think maybe there's a, a question underlying or a, there's an issue under, underlying um, the, the point from, is it Philip Beasley there, um, which, which is a, it seems as if maybe we're losing something if we try to, if we try too hard to upload precision into the environment. What we really want to do is to make sure that we don't upload all the precision into the environment. We continue to train the, 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 the sort of onboard biological system so that they can pick up on small hints and assign precision in the right sorts of ways. And this puts me very much in mind of the sort of debates that I would have back in the, you know, back in the extended mind days between sort of, you know, the worry that it's just dumbing us down if we start to rely on our smartphone too much versus the idea that we can be hybrid holes that do better. We, you know, the, the good thing is that you don't really have to choose between these things. I don't think there's any evidence that being immersed in a world where there's an awful lot of easy precision indicators makes us less able to assign precision in very, very subtle ways uh, when we need to. So it doesn't strike me that there's a real worry there, but it is something that designers want to take seriously because I think that human beings will get actually quite, quite good affective um, payoffs for being able to do things using these very, very subtle external cues. There's a sort of, I think they give us a chance to minimize more than expected amounts of prediction error as we go along. And that's the thing that we seem to find affectively most rewarding. So it'd be a real shame to somehow purge our human built environments of all those opportunities. Um, maybe, maybe this is something that, uh, you know, as, um, as we sort of have more and more, you know, when, when I look at design magazines nowadays, I see more and more stuff with gardens and grass and, you know, little bits of nature kind of poking out through bits of concrete. Um, and maybe we're doing something like that there. We're making sure that we actually have both of these, both of these modes in operation. Yeah, yeah I do, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking here about how, you know, again, this is kind of Freud thing, how the mind, I put it like a kind of like a, a hydraulic thing, you know, you've had yeah. too much of something, you want something more of something else. You know, I always think in terms of, when I was living in Cambridge, I was, I mean, London was, I mean, Cambridge was great because there was no distractions, you'd produce a lot, you'd work and so on. But every now and again, you wanted the, the, the intensity of a city and you'd kind of, you know, like putting your fingers into an electric yeah. socket, you'd suddenly get this buzz. But at the same time, when you're in London, you wanted to escape and find somewhere tranquil like Cambridge. And I'm, I think there's always this kind of hydraulic sort of mechanism that's going on. And it, actually, there's, it's interesting how there's, there's and I'm, I'm blanking on, on the name of this now, but just very recently, there's been this system that's been developed um, uh, involving AI. And it's, it's, it's to do with music more than visual, but, and I, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll be able to find the actual the, the link and, and show you it. But there's a, there's a guy who's actually a musician who's, who's working now, I think with Bentley, but soon it'll also be Audi, to try and develop a system that will um, 
kind of counterbalance uh, in a way when you're driving. So if you're kind of being lethargic, it'll kind of give you a bit of music that's going to kind of um, stimulate yeah. you. And if you're going too fast, it'll try and calm you down kind of thing. And it also, it, it changes as you turn left and turn right and all these different things. It's a very, very interesting project and it's very, very new. Um, but it's about this kind of almost the counterbalance. Um, you know, so sometimes we absolutely need something and sometimes we need something else. And to Philip's example, um, uh, he's in Canada, so he's obviously thinking about what it's like to, in the wilds of Canada. But even in the city, there's a model like you must know. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Guy Debord and the, and the Situationists and the, the notion of the derive. The Situationists were a kind of a, uh, they were they were criti uh, criticizing. I mean, uh, the, the spectacle, which is like the visual domain that has become it's back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in, in France, uh, and they were looking at ways how you might resist a certain overload and and. They had the social derive where you you would explore the city and allow your passions to take over and follow this particular path and in, out of curiosity rather than this kind of you know, the, the 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 system that, that that we have let's say with traffic lights and things that tell us what to do to do the opposite to 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 so i guess there are all these different sort of variations within the theme that uh, in yeah. some ways prove the model but also challenge the model that you're trying to sort of put up I mean, I think we see something a bit like sort of what you were describing there in some of the um, some of the apps and environments that are being created for dementia patients now. So, you know, the idea with a lot of those is to to support, obviously, by by kind of, you know, taking a lot of the pressure off the biological brain, but also to challenge, to challenge enough times to keep the biological systems in sort of as good work in order as they can be. And so that sort of you know, having ambient systems that are watching our behaviours and challenging us um, at what they think is the right time is, I think, a kind of, it's a future world that we might end up living in. I, um, you know, it's one that you might very well have, have some qualms about, uh, you know, taken to extremes. Uh, you know, I like to decide when to be challenged normally rather than have it suddenly happen. But, um, but I think we, you know, it's certainly the technology is there and I think the dementia support systems are a very interesting part of this because they certainly extend through smartphones, architectures, uh, you know, painting the doors in care homes the way that your the way that your home door used to be so that you can find your way back more easily, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And there's some stories about how they, they have these care homes where they're, it's all about ritual and repetition. Yeah. And familiarity the care home becomes like a, a high street and they can have coffee in certain places and no i absolutely agree that's fascinating sort of behavior i want we've got some some questions in the chat um oh, gustavo um i'm wondering if you want to you, there's several questions there maybe you'd like to ask which yeah. uh, uh, one of those questions gustavo is a is a, a postdoc uh he's uh he's uh, uc santa barbara um was just uh an architect by training but working in the world of media art. Gustavo, would you like to uh, ask a question? Uh, sure, thank you very much, Professor Clark. Uh, yeah. Extremely inspirational and fascinating. I think a lot of my questions um, have to do with uh, thinking about information as a way to analyze some of this. Um, in the last year, um, um, I think following Neil's um, doctoral consortium, we're going to AI and looking at creativity. But then a, a lot of the um, experts that have been speaking are talking about the creation of these um, intelligent systems. Uh, so my question would be, how do you how do you see the equivalency of an expert? I think going through a lifespan, a human lifespan, collapsing the visual. Uh, the informational, the audio, even the tactile, all those senses as intelligence, and then uh, figuring out how to collapse those models into a world or making them into a world and then analyzing them. Because I, I thought it was a very compelling image that you showed about the, the world image. It seems that they'd had sonic waves, visual waves, and graphical language, and also uh, spatial. Um, knowledge. Um, I work for. I work in an instrument, and uh, and my postdoc is at uh, the Allosphere, which is at uh, UC Santa Barbara, by Dr. Kachamarin, and we made an actual sphere, and we go in there and we study how information 
uh, impacts the body and intelligence and creates collaboration. So uh, if you can speak to yeah. how, how you would hypothetically look at all this intelligence and knowledge and think through um, kind of uh, giving us a seed of these expert systems in relation to your current research. Cause I'm just fascinated. Yeah. I never really thought through yeah. that, um, that by reading and it's, experiencing this knowledge mm -hmm. that um, I never really thought through how it made me. But yeah. if you think about a child learning, yeah. if a child makes a clay pot and they accomplish a goal, they actually can reimagine and remake their world differently. So are you looking at it as a, and sorry about the long question. Uh -huh. It's, you're, are you looking at it through the metaphor of how a child learns versus how a human learns and versus how an expert learns and a, then a society learns? Because then it's societal intelligence or super intelligence. Yeah, well, I think there are elements of super intelligence in here. There are elements of the, the idea that, you know, the, that notion of sort of, you know, a kind of uploading precision into the, into the environment, that's kind of pushing pushing intelligence into the uh, into the built world. It's just one of many, many ways that we do that. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about learning in general. So there was not supposed to be an emphasis there on children, although, of course, you know, children probably uh, have kind of, you know, um, less, less well-formed predictive models, and therefore they can uh, acquire more stuff from exposure to a structured environment. You know, that's, um, that's clearly the case. Um, maybe what we're gonna see, I think, is, is a case where our technologies put us in touch with information streams in ways that are more, kind of more useful to human beings. So, you know, maybe that's what personal AIs will do if you've got a personal on-device AI. Maybe its job is to kind of curate a lot of data streams take a bunch of small decisions for you, um, but kind of um, sort of be part of a sort of a, a kind of single cognitive machine that is sort of you plus this little pile of personal AIs that move through life together. Um, that's certainly a certainly a vision that I've been that I've been tempted by, and you know part of that might involve taking complex data streams and turning them into forms that humans find it a bit easier to interact with. So, you know, there's an awful lot of information out there about, I don't know, different microwaves or something. Um, maybe my personal AI can do something very useful with that and turn it into something um, much more easy for me to interrogate and interact with. Maybe that would be a sort of a, a way of curating data streams so as to sort of make them into the kind of objects that we can do more with. That's, you know, I think that's, um, I think that's, you know, that's possible with current technologies. And I think we'll probably see more of it with, you know, augmented reality type technologies. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I think there's something else going on in your question. I'm not, I'm not quite on top of yet. And I think I, I, I might come back on the, to, to ask you just to say another word about that. I'm just looking at the way that you expressed it in the, oh. in the chat. Uh, so, so Professor Clark, I think yeah. to, just to interject, I think yeah. the implications are are massive. Like, if you really think about this, I, I um, it, architecture, uh, new media, and computer science, and then um, looking at the the study of how humans evolve and learn, yeah. we're looking at really thinking through how we can flow through the world, and if it takes away your ability to choose this this uh -huh. instinctive yeah. uh, behavior of learning mm -hmm. and you're replacing it with an algorithmic filter mm -hmm. of um, curation okay. then yeah. what are the implications yeah. of human evolution because I think if you're an intelligent person you might be able to choose your algorithm or code yeah. differently your experience yeah. but what yeah. about those those individuals that can't, then what is our responsibility as makers and researchers there? Right. Well, so there are 
certainly there are big questions about you know differential access to the kinds of technologies that might um, that might be uh, sort of implicated in, in extended mind or entangled mind scenarios. Um, you're also, I think, raising a, a kind of worry there that you know we might be sort of losing that the people that are entangled like that are losing a, a certain amount of um, of their own sort of freedom. And I think there's that that trade off is 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 kind of always there. It's that's not really a new thing though, is it? I mean, just by you know, just by being um, brought up in a certain part of London and going to a certain school, I'm, I'm sort of shown a curated stream of, 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 of information and opportunities. Um, so in a way, I think it's just the kind of situation that we humans are bound to be in. You know, we're not, you can never choose from everything. You can only choose from whatever it is you can see. <laughs> um, so, so maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not, I don't see a big existential threat in these sorts of um, technologies, um, I think that there are practical that there are practical threats because of ownership issues. So you know, some of the, the sort of technologies I might be thinking about there tend to be owned by big corporations. Maybe that's a bit different to being brought up in one corner of South London. Um, so I think those are real issues. Um, uh, but, uh, Professor Clark, one, one question, yeah. one one additional yeah. question. And the PhD journey that I went through, I had to go through the classics or I had to go through right. learning coding or mathematics or yeah. what about the resistance and the, 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 the joy and the, I would say the, the quality of the knowledge gained by that mm -hmm. investigation. How do you account for that possible loss uh, in your new understanding of these different signs that are moving you? Because um, I wouldn't have taken a journey if I didn't have advisors and colleagues and an understanding of a certain field evolving from yeah. my own thoughts. Yeah. But these filters could literally program you and having different segments of societies look at certain things. It would be more regimented learning, I would say. Um, it could be. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still enough of a techno optimist to think that it doesn't have to be. Um, that you know, it's possible to have to have stuff that is kind of very sensitive to very small individual differences, and can sort of, you know, as your as you change and evolve during your lifetime, it simply is kind of picking up on small things and maybe amplifying them a bit, but just in the way that friends and colleagues might do that anyway. Um, I'm not sure it has to be worse than that. Um, but yes, it's uh, you know there's a there's a there's a wide space of possibilities here. I guess in a way, I'm most interested right now, at least, in just understanding the nature of the entanglement. But if we do start to understand the nature of the entanglement better, then that's a very good time, I think, to start asking very important questions about you know what are good entanglements and what are worse entanglements and who gets to make that decision. <laughs> Um, yeah so thank you it's, it's been a pleasure I really really have enjoyed it thank you thank you thank you um, <clears throat> Andy we've got a, a series of, uh, of, of questions in the chat Every, we've got people watching from all, all over Harif has just joined us from Baghdad there's Inan Har Ansari from uh, uh, Iran and uh, uh, Emmanuel Ko from, from Singapore and, and so on. I, I want to ask Iman uh, Ansari if he would, would like to ask his question. Um, if not, I can ask it. And my, I can I can just read it out myself. But Iman, um, would you like hi. Thank you. First of all, thanks for wonderful lecture. Uh, I've got a good question about something like a Gartner hype cycle or Uncanny Valley. How do you explain these phenomena uh, with your predictive processing model? You know, there is a drop off affiliation or as you just mentioned it right now entanglement with these object or um, more specifically an adaptation of uh, artificial general intelligence and um, yeah. we see the rise again and i don't i it's hard for me to form a you know good relationship between your model and a phenomenon like this or Gartner hype cycle, you could see it all over. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question about the uncanny valley thing. I mean, it is sort of, it's easy enough to say 
something in general about how a predictive processing system might um, experience, if you allow me to use that word for a moment, uh, a kind of unhappy, unhappy, uncanny valley effect, because this will be a case where um, you've had an awful lot of experience with, let's say, human faces. You're making some quite strong predictions. A small amount of prediction error could be assigned very high precision in those cases. And so you want to keep sort of trying to revise a model to, to get rid of that small a bit of residual prediction error, but you can't because it's an uncanny valley case. And so maybe that's a sort of slightly uncomfortable situation for us to be in. At the same time, just having said that, I think it's also true that, you know, the, the apparatus on the table for a predictive processing story is really flexible. It, it does seem as if you can fit it to just about any experiential profile that you could come up with. You can kind of see how you might fit it. And I think that what that shows is that actually when we theorize using these tools at the moment, we're not sufficiently constrained. Um, you know, in a way, it's a, it's a kind of toolkit and you can fit it to anything in order for it to become more constrained so that it says more interesting things. Um, I think it's going to need to co-evolve a lot more with a particular story about neural implementation so that you can then begin to say, you know, actual and testable things about how you expect these systems to behave if, you know, the brain implements predictive processing in a certain way and has been trained on a certain range of cases and is then thrown a, an, an uncanny valley kind of case. Um, you know, obviously, I don't think we're there yet, but, um, but that's sort of, that's my kind of rough, my sort of rough feeling is that it sounds to me like phenomenologically uncanny valley, uncanny valley responses are um, very consistent with a predictive processing framework but consistency strikes me as a relatively cheap thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't uh, know if that gets there or not. Yeah, Neil. Yeah, uh, Emmanuel yeah. Coe has got a question. Emmanuel Coe is a, a yeah. study at the Architecture Association, Association in London, did a PhD in Switzerland, is now a professor in Singapore, and was the, is the author of the first book in English on, on AI and architecture. Emmanuel. Hi. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks Neil. Um, thanks, Andy, for the very interesting talk. Um, I've got a question. Um, so I'm just going to read it from the, the chat. So the today's deep generative models, such as the Stalgan that you, you mentioned just now, they are actually internally randomizing or to call it properly uh, regularizing, but injecting noise directly into the successive layers of the generator, meaning the upsampling stream. So my question is really related to the, the, the fourth point that you mentioned, the breaking of the self-model. Can we not somehow break our mental model internally by similar sort of randomization or changing the neural uh, connectivity and, there, and therefore offloading that burden from the external world? And perhaps in, in that sense, how it might then relate to the metaverse in the future. And yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, uh, Eric Paul, he, he got this uh, hypothesis called the overfitted brain hypothesis. So the idea is that um, he linked the, he's a neuro, neuro philosopher, quite an interesting uh, <laughs> job. Um, so he's, his hypothesis is that it is necessary uh, for us to dream as a way to kind of avoid overfitting so if i experience everything you know like like let's say max hawking yeah. as an example doing the same thing for many months yeah. one way to get out of it rather than following a kind of external randomization algorithm is to go into this dreaming state yeah. and that provide that opportunity for kind of a virtual breaking yeah so i i think yeah. i yeah i would like to hear your views thanks yeah no those are great questions um and i think you're I think you're right that there's an awful lot of sort of um, internal versions of this kind of um, this kind of external model breaking that I'm talking about. Um, in a way, the sort of you know the kind of um, even the predictive processing stories about what's going on during sleep and dreaming seem to have that sort of flavour that you know you're trying to um, you're trying to find the minimal model that would. Uh, that would make successful predictions, and that's a way of getting rid of an awful lot of uh, a lot of unnecessary stuff that's in your model. So you can kind of reduce model complexity while you while you sleep. That's the kind of 
that's the picture that they have sounds very much like the overfit in brain hypothesis that you were mentioning there. Um, it's also true that there are other things that we can do to disturb the, the sort of deep self model. It might be that deep brain stimulation is doing something like that for um, people who have you know, those forms of depression that you can't otherwise treat. Could be that what deep brain stimulation is doing is something uh, a little bit like what the psychedelic drugs are doing or what Max Hawkins was trying to do by his randomization algorithms. Um, I guess what I'd say about the sort of neural techniques right now is that they're pretty heavy handed. They're sort of, they're rather, they're kind of rather blunt instruments. Whereas, um, you know, if we, um, if we, if we externalize something and then try to re-encounter it, then we can bring all of our perceptual and manipulative skills to bear in a way that maybe allows us to do things a little bit more systematically. But there might very well be, you know, all kinds of things that are best done with a blunt instrument. And, it, you know, it could, it could be that, um, you know, we just need to have the right combinations of these things. I think one, one thing that, 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 that I'm attracted to in the, the way that I think predictive processing is going to think about these things is that very often there won't be much to choose between a kind of external manipulation and an internal manipulation. You know, you're basically... You're, 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 you're trying to manipulate certain levels of, of processing in some way. And you can do that by changing the environment or by changing the brain, um, by changing patterns of embodied interaction. And I think by, by seeing a kind of equivalence between these things, we, I think we can take our environments more seriously. You know, if we start to think that the worlds that we live in are as important to the way that we think as the way that neurotransmitters flow around our brains, um, then maybe that will, that will be a, a kind of ethically quite a, quite a good way to think about our world. We'll start um, assigning them a kind of importance that maybe is otherwise a bit hard to see. Uh, maybe we see this in some, in some things like, uh, like PTSD, where immersion in a certain kind of environment really changes neural processing in ways that, um, that clearly um, can then you can then try and respond to that um, in ways that can go directly to, to sort of addressing kind of um, sort of neurotransmitter responses or by um, or by changing environmental stuff. Um, so there's a that's a that didn't come out quite the way that I wanted it to come out, but the kind of idea there is that, that I think there's a sort of symmetry between what we do outside and what we do inside in many of these cases. But at the same time, I found myself very interested by those cases where the symmetry seemed a bit broken, like those cases where people could do something by externalizing into a diagram that they seem to find very hard to do just by running imagery inside the head. And, you know, maybe there'll be technological innovations that let us run imagery um, inside the head in those sorts of ways too, in which case, great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So Thanks. thank you anyway. I think that I think the general issue about um, about internal ways of breaking models and sort of changing the way that we assign precision to different levels of the model is, um, is hugely important. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, Matt Gorbe has a question. Matt, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Yes. Thanks so much for this. Okay. It's nice to see. Uh, one of the things I'm struck by is how in this series, um, this idea of predictive processing and the brain as prediction machine keeps, it, that, that concept kind of keeps coming back from different perspectives, from different speakers. And in particular, like in, in this case, the cognitive science uh, look at it, or maybe the sociology look at it versus the yeah. uh, neurophysiology look yeah. at it, that Jeff Hawkins kind of his approach with a thousand brains. Um, and, and it's nice to kind of think about how that all comes together. One of the themes that keeps coming back is this question of what is creativity and can we model creativity or can we create creativity? What is it for a computer or an algorithm to be creative? And I think that's what you've been um, uh, proposing as this model revealing or model model breaking, um, breaking our own model with something in order to think creatively about it um, is really super relevant. And also, um, 
ties to the same way that Yasha Bach was, was describing it as being about bridging discontinuities in a search space. So it's like we have our search space and then, you know, you have a discontinuity. So you do a creative thing to kind of break it out and then re reform it, you'll re reformulate it. Yeah. So, so this ties to, so this introduces my question, but my question has always been, you know, I've always thought about art and the role of art in, in, in cultures as, as a way of, uh, of, of kind of inserting something new to, to generate new thinking or to provoke people. Um, and in a lot of ways, that's, that's what artists, a lot of artists do. So with this model, I guess what I'm interested in your perspective on is um, different people respond differently to novelty. So some people will see a work of art and they'll really appreciate it and find it really you know, interesting and valuable because it makes them think in different ways. Other people see a work of art and they find it and they dismiss it because they don't you know, they can't relate to it. And they say, no, you, this is novel. And it's just as novel for each individual. But for some people or in some ways, that kind of novelty will lead us in a in a new direction. Other people will, will reject it and sometimes very forcefully or even violently. So yeah. does your model kind of start to poke at why that why that happens? Is it is it simply like a second order pattern that we're now you know, we've been, you know, it's like we've been trained to respond to novelty in a different way. And it's the same thing about pattern finding, or is there more to it than that? Is it sort of more animal brain? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, I think this is kind of in the ballpark of stuff that we were talking about earlier, where um, sort of small individual differences will lead to cascades in processing over time that mean that you're not really encountering the same situation in some sense. You know, we both walk mm -hmm. into the art gallery we both see the same painting, but um, you know the cascades of um, precision weighted prediction error that occur in my brain are going to be very, very different to the ones that occur in yours. And indeed, I might already be assigning precision in ways that make me, in effect, immune to that painting. Something like mm. you know, yes, there's no, there's no precise prediction error being created by it. <laughs> um, so there's nothing for me to revise. Um, there's, you know, my model stays just the way it was. Um, whereas if it engages me more directly, then maybe suddenly there's a little cascade of prediction error minimization that I didn't see coming. And um, that does seem to be that case where we get something like an aha moment or a sort of mm -hmm. affective chill, that little, that moment where you get goosebumps at a certain, at a certain point when encountering certain works of art or, 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 or pieces of music. Um, and so, so I think that that sort of the aha moment there is probably best modeled as a sudden cascade in which you're collapsing precise prediction error at multiple levels. And um, different people are going to get that cascade at different times just due to their different histories, which is a bit boring. It's just saying what we already knew that, you know, people are different. <laughs> but um, yeah. But it, I mean, it does speak in some way to the sort of nature versus nurture and to this idea that over time you're learning these patterns of whether you should be you should be repelled or attracted to some some new thing or open to a new idea. And maybe that there's in, in terms of this idea of externalizing yeah. these things into the environment, maybe there's lessons there for designers about how to create things that are more conducive to novelty. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I've seen there's some interesting work that Patty Mays and some of the MIT um, people are doing with something, uh, a kind of artificial prosthesis that is supposed to help you induce that mo that sort of moment of affective frisson, whatever it is, a sort of goosebumpy feeling. And it basically, mm -hmm. it sort of gives you the, it gives you the sort of temporarily staged effects on your skin that you would otherwise get at that moment. And maybe then, if you do that at roughly the right time, you can sort of drive that system a little bit in the other direction too and give someone uh, at least an experience of greater ascetic engagement in a way that's driven a little bit from the outside, a bit like, a bit like all that stuff about putting your mouth in a smiling position and you feel a bit better. <laughs> right. right. Interrupt the loop or pre presuppose yeah. the loop yeah. to get it going. Yeah, exactly. yeah. To yeah. Cram the pump as it were. Thank yeah. you. That's cool. That's interesting. So thanks, Matt. <clears throat> I should say Matt is a, a colleague of Philip Beasley. He's in Canada, and uh, um, uh, he's uh, a great MIT media lab, currently doing All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, cool. So we've got a question from Mirich. Um, I'm glad she's asking a question because her, her doctoral research is about kind of very similar territories. Um, Mirich, would you like to ask it? Uh, Mirich is, is in Serbia, but she's doing a PhD in Shanghai at Tongji. Mirich. Cool. 
thank you and thank you for your presentation. Uh, so I was wondering about the difference in perception between it and the three dimensional space and that of the pre-recorded space. So the one that lacks actual three dimensionality. And uh, how is this secondhand experience appropriated mm -hmm. internally in spatial terms? Um, that's my question. I can go more specifically, but that's it. Just a little, say just a little bit more, if you, if, if, if you were just to... Um, I mean, I can see there's a difference between a 3D space and a, a 2D representation of a 3D space. Is it sort of how do I engage? Uh, yes, but also, uh, what happens to the prediction error minimization when something like the focus point is already defined? And we are perceiving it so we have our own internal individual response to what we're seeing what we sh we are sharing seeing and uh, how is then when something is already defined how is it then appropriated internally individually i see yeah i mean it's i don't have any anything very general to say about that at the moment but it is something that the escape project wants to look at because one of the things that we want to do is to compare um, the case where you actually put a replica pot in someone's hands, as it were, and then let them um, saccade around the pot versus the cases that we used in the pilot study, which is showing a 2D representation of a replica pot and letting them saccade around that. So, you know, the, the hope is that by using both real things and 2D representations and also uh, virtual reality setups where people can kind of, um, engage with uh, digital objects in that sort of way that we'll begin to get some sort of some sort of handle on the ways that um, the ways that attention can behave in these different environments and try and see whether there's something fundamental about some environments that uh, maybe like the real 3d world plus the uh, virtual reality environment that is just distinctively different to the way it behaves in 2d environments that sounds that sounds quite likely to me um, but you know we haven't we haven't done the experiments, but but, but we will. Okay. Well, thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you. Um, so, uh, um, Hadi Benaz um, is returning the gaze, as it were, and uh, she's going to be. She has a question. Benaz, would you like to ask a question? Hello. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you fine. Yeah. All good. Hi Andy, uh, great to um, great to see you. I'm sorry that my webcam doesn't work, um, so I have to be just on my uh, phone. Um, well, it was it was amazing presentation. There's so much to think about, and it certainly affects. Um, I would love to have future uh, conversations and potential collaborations with you on this. Uh, sure. The topic of gaze and visual perception is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, I guess my question um, is, uh, how do you think of um, gaze and eye contact in the context? I mean, I was very intrigued when you talked about different also uh, social organizations in terms of like hierarchical versus non-hierarchical organizations and how that affect um, our um, almost like eye movements uh, or visual perception. Um, my question is, uh, have you been thinking or working on social interactions? Like when we do have eye contact with one another, our interaction obviously has changed. Like it also changed the hierarchy of interactions when we are looking into each other's eyes versus we avoiding each other. That's one part of my question. And then within the same vein of uh, question, I'm interested in interaction of multiple people with the environment through where people are looking. In other words, when we are in a new space or new environments, how we interact with this space is a lot of time informed by how other people are interacting with this space. And many times that's come through where they're looking. So the sort of our attention um, is very much informed by the, the, the dynamics of um, eye movements of other people in this space. So I'm just curious, how do you think about gaze in the context of social interaction yeah. and multi-people um, agents in the environment? Yeah, I think that's a, it's, a, it's a really important area. We do want to look at that area a bit um, using some of these tools. Um, at the moment, 
it's you know most of the work that uh, that the group has done has really been without a social context you know and we we do realize that social context just changes the game in many in many sorts of ways and particularly changes the game for um for gays um you know, one thing I I think that happens there is that there, you know, there is a sort of a a kind of embodied dance between different um, different people that are I that are able to to see each other either in three D space or two D space, um, and you know what happens there is that small cues get amplified. You you're able to you know assign precision in ways that then has this sort of cascading cascading spiral of precision um sometimes for better sometimes for worse so yeah you know the idea that uh, maybe if you expect somebody to be angry you encounter them and you see what would otherwise be a neutral face is just very very slightly angry looking and that could easily happen on a predictive processing story and then of course you behave differently with respect to them and things could start to spiral in bad ways and you know that has very good analog too when things go well um maybe we see some of that in in cases of um of sort of um improvisation in a musical group for example where being able to pick up on small cues from the other players seems really important so so i think understanding how how these sorts of precision assignments are kind of um i don't know sort of springboarding around in social and collective spaces in ways that are in turn structured by the environment that you happen to be in would be you know that's a very that's a very interesting area that you know we would obviously love to understand better um maybe there's actually something there about creativity as well it could it could be that there is a sort of i mean it seems non-accidental that we think of a lot of these contexts kind of being in a group with people, brainstorming, um, playing music together as places where creativity tends to emerge in some ways. And, uh, you know, maybe that's because of a relaxation of constraints, because these kind of small things can be passed around and get bigger. Um, whereas maybe when we're doing it just more internally or without so many cues, then we tend to damp things down with our own best prediction systems. Um, don't know, that's kind of speculation, but. Um, but I certainly think that it's a it's a fascinating area. So yes, I would love to talk more talk more about it and see if there's anything that we could do together on it. That'd be great. Um, so we've got a bunch of more questions. Marina um, Rodriguez das Neves, uh, thank you, Benaz, uh, is from um, Argentina, um, currently doing a DDES. And uh, Marina, if you'd like to uh, ask your question. Right. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello, Andy. Thank you for your. Hi. for your presentation and uh, for the interesting conversation and uh, i'd like to come back uh, to, to this idea that you presented about uh, externalizing precision uh, it does include in your opinion a kind of a intensif intensification of existing models i mean uh, as a kind of way to recognize fissures or breakdowns uh, or errors or yeah. in reality it's a kind of it's a way to break self models, as you mentioned in the last point, uh, yeah. kind of suspension of the judgment. Yeah, could you just say just a little bit more about that? So is, it, is, it, is the idea that it sort of amplifies, um, amplifies things that we might not want amplified or? Yeah, I mean, um, I was thinking and this kind of um, externalizing precision is yeah. that it's a kind of logic of a, um, extreme rigor for example that you can intensify a model until the the the, the at the moment that you can yeah. exactly um break the model in a certain way yeah um or if you yeah, yeah. i think probably, you, I, you talk I, about this dictatorship of uh yeah. uh yeah. like a, 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 as an escape of it to the own so it seems to be something a little bit destructive in terms of yeah uh, your your model so i was thinking in what way this model you can intensify it in reality and then is how you find uh the way to to in a yeah. in a positive way to work with the model uh yeah. as a kind of way to find its own fissures or, or breakdowns okay. yeah i mean i guess if i understand that right that there are you know there are 
there are sort of two, at least sort of two ways that you can behave in the, in, in the sort of presence of a, an externalized model of some kind. You know, it could be that it sort of helps, it, it kind of just helps you understand the way things are a bit better so that you become more comfortable with the way things are. So, you know, maybe your big model of the training shoe just kind of shows you that um, this is actually going to be a very good training shoe. I'm rather happy with this, you know, it's probably going to work. Um, and then other times, um, creating the model, maybe intensifying it. I want, to, I want to sort of understand that a bit better, but maybe it's sort of like turning up the volume on it, making it a bit of a caricature of whatever, whatever it was to begin with. Um, may, maybe the, those will be cases where we're really inviting ourselves to do something a little bit more destructive with the model. Um, I, I imagine there's a whole spectrum of, of ways that, that it will be useful to behave, just depending on... Yeah you know depending on what we're trying to do and how well we're doing at it <laughs> um, yeah because yeah, yeah i mean i mean I, I was thinking about something that it's part of my thesis i'm, a, I'm an architect and i'm uh, usually trying to understand uh not as an architect as a way of self-referentiality -refer but in a way to understand the internal rules of the model to right. work from inside the model and not as a way of you know like externalize the problem as yeah. usually is what is happening in architecture right now. So uh, I was thinking about, about that, that. The idea of intensification is to try to understand like the internal rules and from the inside, right. try to find the features of this, like, this kind of breakdown from this, of the system and then work from there. So that was my question about the, this kind of idea of externalizing precision, what it seems to be in a way uh, associated with uh, the way we create knowledge in terms of how we organize things for yeah. example or how we work with this kind of rigor rigorosity in terms yeah. to understand what we do it doesn't matter which discipline you are you know what yeah. what is the field you're working on yes i think i mean i'm trying to think of what what those cases would look like i mean would this be a case of that if i if, if, if you if you're designing a, a space some kind of um, mm -hmm. public space and you um and you then get to walk through that space as a virtual reality and kind of encounter your design in a way that um, that is intensified in that in that in that sense. It's like you know now you can see all of the consequences of the the various bits of design that might not have been obvious when you you know from the stage before that. Is that a case of intensification? If so, then 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 yes, I think that's. Uh, I think be. that's in the same sort of business. It's you know, it, 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 yeah. it providing opportunities to attend to the domain in in new ways that might reveal new things, or they might not reveal new things. Is that, okay. I don't know okay. if that's an example yeah. or not. So if you're thinking of of other kinds of more dramatic example, maybe. Um, yeah, let's say we have. Uh, imagine that we think about it. so we have a kind of um, uh, discipline which is based on all these existing models all what yeah. you learn you were trained for no? right. so you have all these existing models uh, so the way that you identify the model is let's say you uh, studying like in detail all these models mm -hmm. with this kind of <laughs> and to the, the, the I mean let's say to the level of the obsession <laughs> even mm -hmm. <laughs> and then yeah. from there from this kind of uh, internal logic, you can yeah. understand how to break this model or how to uh, think for I think it. See. Okay, now I think I understand better. So the idea is to use the model to, as, a, as a kind of stepping stone to be able mm -hmm. to break the model better because you use the model to understand things better. Um, and then maybe you need to do something else or do, you know, take some other action in order to put more pressure on it. Yeah. I suppose yeah. that's right. You know, just uh, understand. Yeah. Um, I think I, I think that has to be right. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, mean, I, 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 I was thinking these images you were showing of a, a school, and they work yeah. with an incredible huge amount of data from architectural yeah. buildings. So you right. work with a kind of archive. Okay. Well, <laughs> so yeah. you work with existing models. Let's okay. Say, not like, and, yeah. and then you, but then you, in a way, you try to incorporate some. Yeah. Uh, scientific, let's say, intelligence and how you process the building. 
Right. But my, my question is how you can intensify this. Because in this way, this uh, externalizing precision is a kind of yeah. mapping understanding of art that you can organize this existing knowledge and then you work with it. Yeah. That's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there are two things going on there. The externalizing precision thing is, is kind of the, the, the sort of um, change in the environment in ways that, uh, that, that kind of do some of the precision estimation that the biological brain would otherwise be having to do. Um, that, you know, just color coding things, for example. Um, yeah. so, so that's an example of that. And that doesn't yet seem to me to be in the ballpark of externalizing something so as to stress test it or, or try to, um, you, you know, break the model up so that you can think about things in a new way. Um, that seems to be a rather more a, pro, a process that, 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 that is kind of more advanced in some way. I think, you know, I think uploading precision into the environment is something we can't help but do. It's just, you know, I think that uh, even non-human animals upload precision into their environments just by moving around in them and re-encountering their own trails, for example. Um, whereas we humans seem to just do something that continuously moves the goalposts for our own sort of prediction driven learning and that's something that I, I i feel like i want to understand that better you know where the predictive process in story applies to all kinds of brains it's not just human brains and yet there's something special about humans that has enabled us to do this stuff and i don't think that we understand that well enough just by looking inside i think it's something special about our sort of lineage our sort of material lineages somehow that along the way we have maybe by accident, maybe by a group of small adaptations that just happened to come together in the right way to make this possible. Um, we have the idea that we are thinking creatures and we can then deliberately materialize our ideas and put pressure on them. Um, and something that I was actually contemplating talking about, but I decided that, I, that it was just too speculative even by my standards, which is saying something. <laughs> <laughs> was, um, was that, uh, that maybe in that, um, in that sort of lineage, sort of thinking about thinking came after symbolic culture, maybe. Maybe for sort of practical purposes, we developed a kind of symbolic culture, maybe tying knots in bits of string to kind of record um, transactions and, you know, who had spent what on what, sort of stuff that Ed Hutchins has talked about. But as we encounter these sorts of traces, it leads us to begin to have the idea that we have ideas about the world. We begin to see that our ideas about the world aren't just, that they kind of, they become objects for us. And then we can structure our environments with sort of deliberate, um, deliberate ways to change the ways we think about the world. So at that point, we become what I think um, Priston has lately called a sophisticated inference agents, ones that... Um, ones that have an eye not just on their future behaviours, but on their own future beliefs. Um, and a lot of art and science, I think, is about improving our own beliefs about ourselves, about our world. That seems to require your beliefs to be a sort of object somehow. And so I, I think there's a, an interesting question there. When in, when in the evolution of our abilities to deal with worlds, did thoughts become objects for us? Uh, but anyway, it's pretty speculative. I think that is part of that is part of what's going on there. You know, so when we intensify models in this way, I think it's because because we know ourselves as thinking agents, and therefore that we we know that we know that there would be big bonuses to improve our thinking about the world, as opposed to just improving our ways of dealing with the world. Anyway, I, I went a long yeah, way. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I like this shift that when you change, you you start this shift when you start thinking not how we change things as humans, but yeah. more how we are being changed by these models in reality. Yeah. Because that, that I believe that could be a good shift in terms of how we think our own history, in terms of not only how we, in the case of architecture, how we create architecture, but also how architecture is changing us yes. finally. Or how this new intelligence are changing us when we are we we yeah. don't have this kind of idea of control. Yes, <laughs> I think that's think right. I think it's really it's very much trying to do justice to that that side of the causal equation where it's not coming from us to the world; it's coming from the world to us. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Andy. And you got—I um, don't know if you remember in uh, Shanghai, but uh, uh, Jane Jishen was took you around uh, the the Shanghai yeah, town. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jane is in is in in Amsterdam now doing a PhD. Uh, Jane, you have a question. Go ahead. Hey, Professor Clark. Hey, lovely to see you again. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. So my question, actually, I think you already partially answered in the last question, um, is about how the outside world will impact our, our models. But I particularly like to ask the question about how the outer world can impact on the process of model breaking. Because nowadays we are entering into a so-called smart city area, like uh, we are surrounded by more and more intelligent uh, um, device and environment which would tailor the service to specific uh, consumers or individuals. Mm -hmm. And now in, in other ways with those kind of sophisticated digital environment, uh, humans can live in a much more convenient and comfortable way. So I'm yeah. just thinking that this inspired me to think um, if we still, if we, we will live in a much more um, increasingly comfortable environment, then where is the noise? Yeah. Um, how, could we, how could we get the random noise from the outside environment? And that will, yeah, so I just, just wanted to know more about how we can really break uh, the models because many people think they have like a uh, stereotype uh, opinions yeah. about um, different kind of things, different kind of world. Yeah. Uh, it's relatively difficult to um, to continue to build a new knowledge. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I think I well, I I I agree with you that there is a there is a, a real issue there for the world that we live in, where um, you know everything is perhaps. A little bit too curated and there's not enough noise and therefore not so many chances to sort of confront um, uncomfortable aspects of our own model of self or world and, and maybe improve things um, it's you know i guess the max hawkins case is sort of it takes that to extremes you know that was certainly that was a case where i think there was very little noise in a certain sense in his world it was just you know everything went according to plan and the plan was optimal um, except that it didn't seem to deliver affect in the right way. And I think that that's what will save us as, as a human species, is that um, is an affective charge for us really is tied up with this thing of minimizing more than expected amounts of prediction error. So it's being on a good slope of prediction error minimization. And, you know, if your environment doesn't present you with chances to do that, you won't feel happy in your world. Um, now, of course, worlds can present you with chances to do that in ways that are more or less interesting. Um, you know, gambling or video games or yeah. Wordle are all ways of, you know, having a chance to minimize more than expected amounts of prediction error all of a sudden. Um, and they're not all that good for us, even though, you know, like everyone else, I do the Wordle. <laughs> um, but, um, but still, there is that sort of drive and I think as long as that drive is there and it is as, as deep a as deep a thing as there can be about us, um, then we will continue to actively create environments that challenge us. And that's probably why art continues and um, yeah. mm -hmm. philosophy continues and science continues. So, um, so although I think there's a danger there, I think there's something deep in us that means that we'll never completely give in to, to that danger. Yeah, so we still have agency to fight against such kind yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, you know, I think no matter how much stuff you wrap around everything, you know, we will just, um, we will experience agency over the space that remains. And within that space, we will want to find and create challenge. Um, and I, I think, think kind of then the main thing sort of sociopolitically is to make sure that that challenge is kind of the sort that might end up being good for society rather than just something that gets us through the day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe the, intent, the, the challenge also come from the, like such such kind of communications. We yeah. different, have different kind of ideas. Yes, well, I think, that, I think that's right. So sort of, you know, opening up channels so that, um, yeah, so that groups of humans um, with diverse viewpoints get to interact. <laughs> Is, is, is hugely important and powerful and the more we can do it, uh, the better. So yeah, and that probably goes back to um, something that um, 
uh, Bezhnev will say in there as to, to yeah. Yeah, but yeah thank, thank you. you. That's really cool. Thank you very much. Great um, to see you again as well. Yeah, thank you. See you again. So I, I, I'm also thinking of the, the, the notion of the shock that, that Benjamin uh, talks about, because that was a, a crucial part in the kind of decon moment when Bernard Chamy was um, trying to introduce the shock as a way of kind of opening up and, and challenging our assumptions. Um, we've got a question here from Aya Riyad. Um, Aya is in uh, Dubai. Uh, Aya, would you like to ask your question? Ask, ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Neil. And thank you so much, Professor Clark, for this presentation. It's uh, definitely thought provoking. Um, I would like to ask about the minor proof of principle that you have mentioned uh, regarding training a predictive processing brain on the different pottery styles and using different attentional templates uh, that are basically capable of influencing uh, processing for new tasks and domains. I wanted to ask, are there specific tasks or domains which showcase that this transferability was uh, successful from your experiments, or let's say in the future work that your team uh, is planning to uh, undertake, um, how do you imagine which, to, which domains would basically have this transferability uh, applicable to them? Yeah, um, it's, it's, it is such a minor proof of principle that I'm almost embarrassed to actually describe what we actually did by well. <laughs> Um, so all it really amounted to, um, and you know, the papers out there, it, uh, it appeared in, I think, um, uh, Frontiers in Neurobotics or something like that. Um, but basically all it did was kind of showed that um, by, training, by training the uh, artificial active inference agents to saccade around a certain kind of simple little pattern, if they then encountered worlds in which um, there were sort of complex variants on patterns like that around, then they were better at dealing with those worlds. So basically they had an attention profile that was helpful for behavior or for, you know, sucking up structure from this other world, which is no surprise because the other world was structured in ways that were remarkably similar, just a bit more complex than the early one. So it's really, basically all we were doing there was, um, was coming up with some technical tools to enable us to do a kind of transfer of attention schema within the predictive processing framework, which is something that, you know, those tools didn't exist before. And now that we've got those tools, it seems like we might be able to, to run sort of pipelines of experiments like this, hopefully showing something interesting at some point, um, which would be, you know, if what you trained was not just a, a sort of a very simple sort of two layer network, but a network that had multiple layers, you train it to interact with certain patterns, and it learns to assign precision at higher levels in ways that enable it to solve problems in what look like very different domains, in ways that are distinctively different. So what you know, take it into a really different domain. So it's not like a motif of a piece of pottery, but something like solving the mounting car problem, or you know, something, something, uh, something else. Um, and that's of course what we really need to do. So you know, it's probably it's probably not even really a proof of principle until then. But it's uh, but it's a uh, it's a it's a piece of uh, it's a piece of um, it's a procedure. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but yeah, no, I mean, it's a. Uh, I think the proof of. The, the proof or disproof of the interesting claim here about, um, about structured worlds training attention in interesting ways will be whether or not we can come up with simulations that do something, um, something of the kind that you were asking about there, like transfer across domains rather than transfer within a domain. That sounds exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, Andy, this has been great. I don't think we've got any, any further questions. I, I feel we shouldn't be taking too much of your time, but this is a, an incredibly relevant conversation. I think one that's kind of touching on issues that many in architecture have been thinking about for some time. So it's, it's uh, I, I somehow hope that we can maybe continue this conversation. I mean, I really, I mean, first of all, I would like to let all this sink in so we can uh, uh, really uh, take on board and, and think through this thing because it, uh, it's such a provocation, it's such an interesting provocation. And I think there are many people who've been thinking about very similar things in the domain of architecture. So hopefully you want to get some feedback, some really relevant feedback, especially from people like Bernard, who's already thinking about the gaze a lot. And uh, um, yeah. 
I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I just think that you've opened up a Pandora's box of, of interesting questions here that um, uh, has has been, I mean, lot of, lot, a lot to think about. And I think it, it also builds upon uh, the other sessions we had over the last few weeks, which has been an incredible series. Um, so I, I, um, I, I just want to put a question whether anyone else has got any other further questions. I'm, I'm anxious to, to uh, um, <laughs> you've been invitation to go to Santa Barbara. I'm anxious to let you get on with your Sunday, Andy. It's been incredible. Um, uh, any final thoughts from anyone before we, before we close down? Um, I'll just say one thing about Santa Barbara. Uh, my early work on predictive processing basically happened at Santa Barbara. I was a visiting fellow there for a little while. Um, with the Gazaniga group, and, um, and yeah, so I, I, I was presenting stuff on predictive processing way back then. It's a cool place. I, I, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a comment here from uh, Ben Az in, in the chat. Amazing, absolutely amazing, Andy. Thanks for the inspiration. Um, I, I really hope that she could be involved in some collaborations on this That'd thing. Be great. It's so relevant to her, to her discussions. I, the gaze is, is an important yeah. part of all this. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 there's too much to, to, for me to say right now, so I'll keep quiet and maybe say it for a, for a next time when I come down, we can maybe catch up in Brighton over a whiskey or something and talk about these things, because there's so much here, Andy. You're, you're tapping on things, and I think, actually, I'm, I'm, having been ships that kind of pass in the dark without knowing each other, I think it's fantastic now to, to, to introduce you to this kind of this community, because it really is, the, the, I think, in the, exactly what you you need to engage with and help in some way helping us for sure this has been terrific Andy. so thank you for your time um and lots of comments coming in from the from the chat it's great to to to, to be, be so much appreciated it will be uploaded onto onto our youtube library where uh, i suspect there'll be many many more views um and uh, i just want to say finally to thank all the team behind this um uh um, incredible. Um, I did all the graphics for it. Um, and there's also a team, the Digital Futures team, that's working very hard to get things going. It's fantastic. Um, and to say, if anybody else wants to come and join this, uh, uh, the, the, um, the Digital Futures team, we are uh, getting ready. We're ramping up for a big summer festival of workshops in which um, we will have many sessions on, many workshops on AI. You can contact us at info at digitalfutures.world. Um, Andy, thank you. This is this has been. I mean, thank thank been, you all. It's been a been a fabulous conversation. I can't think of a better way to spend Sunday afternoon. It's been really really lovely Sunday afternoon for me. Okay, <laughs> thanks everyone, and uh, the octopus thanks you too. People are. are <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Bye, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye.